Hello, and welcome to the final installment of Recovering Women's Legacies, Artists, Dealers, Collectors, and Patrons, a series of talks co-organized by the Center for the History of Collecting and the Wildenstein Plattner Institute. My name is Sandrine Kanak. I am the Director of Digital Archival Projects at the WPI, and I will briefly introduce today's session, which will consist of a conversation between Véronique chagnon burke and Julie Desjardins around, around the politics of memory and the place of art historical research on women within the broader fields of women's studies and women's social and cultural histories. I will start with Julie. Julie Desjardins is a senior consultant at Paradigm, a diversity, equity, and inclusion firm based in Silicon Valley, as well as an historian of American women and gender. She has a doctorate in American women and gender history from Brown University and has written several books for which she has had to mine for women's experience in the past. The one that is especially relevant to today's discussion is Women and the Historical Enterprise in America, Gender, Race, and the Politics of Memory. In this book, De Jardin explores American women's participation in the practice of history from the late 19th century through the end of World War II, a period in which history became professionalized as an increasingly masculine field of scientific inquiry. Desjardins shows how women nevertheless transformed the profession during these years in their roles as writers, preservationists, educators, archivists, government workers, and social activists. In the process, they not only developed the fields of woman history, but also influenced the creation of our national memory in the 20th century. Now to uh, Veronique. Veronique is an independent scholar and the co-founder of WADA, Women Art Dealers Digital Archives. She is a specialist in, in the history of 19th century French painting, art criticism, the art market, and the role of women in the art world. She received her PhD from the Graduate Center at CUNY and published several books, including the edited volume, Women Art Critics in the 19th Century, Vanishing Acts. She also has organized conferences which bring together art history and art market studies, such as celebrating female agency in the, art, in the arts and women art dealers 1940-1990. Her current collaborative project is the Women Art Dealer Digital Archive, or WADA, a digital platform that maps the role uh, women art dealers played in the institutionalization of modern and contemporary art. Before turning over the digital floor to Julie and Veronique, I would like to remind you that live captioning is available by, by clicking on the CC icon at the bottom of your screen. We'll, we will also make time at the end of this session for Q&A, so please feel free to enter any question in the Q&A box, not the chat box, at any time. Thank you all for joining us today, and thank you, Julie and Veronique, for what I'm sure is about to be a very productive conversation. Thank you so much, Sandrine, for your kind introduction. And uh, before Julie comes on, um, she's already on the screen, but before Julie comes and talks, I thought that I would start by maybe uh, not summarizing the very rich uh, uh, four sessions we already had, but by taking some of the takeaway points that I think will be a good jumping point for Julie's presentation and then our conversation after that. Before that, I want to thank the Free Collection and the WPI for inviting me and for giving us the opportunity to um, participate in this really wonderful project of re rediscovering women and their agency in the art world from the late 19th century to now. Um, over the last four weeks, We've encountered many women who on their own rights have managed to carve a position for themselves in the art world, despite the constraint imposed on by their gender and in some cases by their ethnic background. It would be impossible to sum up all the great point and discovery that the presenter shared with us. But as Julie Desjardins and I prepared our conversation, I thought that a few takeaway points will help us shape what we would be able to discuss. One of the major points is that re recovering these women's life and professional activity forces the researcher to wear as many hats, part detective, part archaeologist, and it is often necessary to find 
um, other ways to get information. So the use of correspondence, and I think that's something Judy is going to be very keen to talk and develop about. But as research becomes more accessible because of the digitization project, we will be able to realize that these women were neither exception nor heroines. The second point is that their, their disappearance is intimately, intimately connected to women's legal status. And the fact that they change name when they're married and that they are often, often only remembered by their, their husband first and last name. It makes them difficult to find. And when you think about women collectors, often their husband paid the bills. And if you think about antique and chinoiserie dealers, often the business was under their, their, their husband's name. So there is a double erasure and difference, uh, difficulty in finding where they are and who they were. The Married Women Property Act in the United States in 1846 allowed women to be ahead of their European counterpart and explained that single women may have maintained more visibility. The other points that I thought were very important to our discussion was that until probably World War II, the lack of professionalization in the art world allowed many of these women to have more agency. It was at the same time an impediment to their visibility as their traces disappear, but it gave them more flexibility when it came to transcend the boundaries imposed on them by the social norms and the construction of gender based on the binary opposition. So we have women as art agents, we have women, uh, wife and daughters of artists who develop the market for their father and their husbands, but often their traces also has been erased. And finally, I think to, um, to actually Sandrine's great point, there is a need for us to permit to to prominentize and to complicate the debate around the legacy, as often the action of their women, most of them were wealthy and white, making them complacent with um, phenomenon like colonialism, and until, and at least in the US until the end of the Civil War with uh, slavery. So I think now Julie should take over and uh, tell us more about this, and then we we will basically be able to continue to and again. Oh, Veronique, I hope I'm not cutting you off. I just, <laughs> the, the internet went a little bit dead there. So I'm just hoping I'm not cutting you off. <laughs> so, uh, well, thank no, you. You're perfect. 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 Oh, great. I hope everybody heard me. We, we heard you until the very, very end. So thank you for that. And thank you for Good. summarizing those points. And thank you for having me uh, with this conversation. And, you know, so Veronique and I had talked a lot about what the focus should be for this final panel in light of all of the wonderful sessions that have come before this one. And we thought it best to try to talk in more general terms, given the stories of women that have been presented already, um, and really about the challenges and the special considerations that have to be accounted for in retrieving the stories of women in this field. And just to be really clear about what I am and what I'm not and what I can contribute to this conversation and, and what I can't, um, I am not an art historian. I'm actually, um, I'm not in the field of art collecting at all. I'm not even a biographer of art collectors, but I am a historian of American women and gender. So I'm, I'm intimately familiar with the challenges of retrieval of women's stories in very similar contexts to the women that we've been hearing about through this series. So I've written on many women in this same period. And when I say this period, I, mainly the women I write about are in the progressive period. So anywhere sort of post-Civil War, till about World War II, give or take, you know, 1880s till about World War II. So I'm quite familiar with the gender dynamics involved in the professionalizing of fields in this period. And I, I'm very happy to field more questions in particular about this sort of professionalization, which is always a, a sort of a gendering process 
um, which in many cases adds to the obfuscation of what women have really contributed to these fields in the public realm. I also specialize in what we call, you know, the historiographical, meaning that I analyze the ways that we tell histories and namely the stories of women in particular. So I had written a book back in 2003, Women in the Historical Enterprise, which is why I was asked to be here today. Um, I guess I will, this is the visual aid part of my presentation. So um, I wrote this back almost 20 years ago now. And in this book, um, basically I talked about how the very process of writing history and telling history is gendered. And I'll suggest a few ways that apply in cases of women art collectors for sure. But I've also just researched and written about a lot of women in this period. And what I've discovered is that there's a real trick to it. So they're stories of professional acclaim. They rarely announce themselves that way, particularly if you want to reveal the headway women have made in public space. So, you know, telling professional success stories is really hard to do because it was not yet appropriate for women to be professionals, right? So these women often had to narrate their own stories to themselves quite differently, let alone how the stories sort of get told through the breadcrumbs of the documents that they leave behind for people like me. So, you know, if you don't present yourself to the world as a professional collector, you certainly don't leave papers behind in ways that allow others to easily decode that story, right? Now, I have not written about art collectors. I have written about a lot of women who are very similar in this period. And so I actually, if you don't mind, I would like to share an example. Um, I have here among my visual aids, this is uh, a book that I wrote last year called American Queen Maker. And it's actually about a woman named Missy Maloney, who's very much like the women that have been featured in these panels in some ways. She's not an art collector in any formal sense, though she certainly sponsored artists. She had an amazing personal collection that was given to her by artists who knew and loved her for sure. But I wasn't really trying to reveal her as a, as a collector. I was actually trying to reveal her as this prototypical feminine leader, which of course to say feminine leader at the turn of the 20th century was an oxymoron as a label, right? I promise you, not she nor anyone else that she dealt with would have called her a leader for modern times, just like many of these other women would not have been called art collectors necessarily, right? Um, but I'm convinced that she is, in fact, a feminine leader. And so I had to try to find that story embedded in the documents that she left behind. And given the culturally masculine meanings that we attach to things like leadership or professional endeavors, you know, Missy herself would not have labeled herself a leader, uh, despite the fact, by the way, that management experts today would have described what she was doing as a very effective brand of leadership, right? But she left tons of documents behind, like many of the women that maybe you've heard about in this series. But she kept them for posterity because many of those documents highlighted the stories of prominent men which was why she thought that they were even important and why she held on to them. And her son donated those papers to Columbia University after she died in 1943. And just, just like Veronique had mentioned with some of these other women, these papers were left under the name of her husband, Mr. William Brown Maloney. So of course, from first blush, you'd never look at the, you know, the title name for this collection and realize that it's a whole treasure trove of letters between not just her and men, but her and a lot of other women that are doing professional work. And I'll tell you, one of the, the greatest sort of gems in this collection are all of the letters between her and her very good friend, the very famous scientist, Madame Curie. So Missy was not just Curie's American benefactress, she was also one of her very dear friends. So anyway, the reframing of Missy's story, you know, the pulling from her papers a story in which she herself was front and center and in which her professional work was visible and acknowledged as professional work, this was not easy. And I imagine this is very much 
the kind of work that the researchers who have presented in these other weeks in this series have had to do to retrieve the stories of women collectors. Now, I've seen this with so many women in this era. You know, they want to make their way doing public forms of work, carrying out passions in ways that were deemed only appropriate for men at the time. And so what they do is they call their activities something else. They practice them under some other guise, deemed appropriate for women in this period, so that no one will question their transgressions. And what I mean by this is they often don't talk about their work in professional terms. They often talk about them in amateur terms. And in fact, oftentimes they don't even talk about it as work at all. Oftentimes they couch it as service or as leisure. You know, it's often not referred to as public work. It's often couched as domesticity. Now, whether they actually believed this themselves or not, they write and collect their stories often in this, this way and through this filter, which requires the researcher to use a very different lens. And I sort of think of this lens almost like an infrared lens, you know, to sort of read between the lines in essence. So women will rarely declare their own professional acumen or successes in this period. Not only because it's not cool for women to toot their own horns in this period or any period, but frankly, it's also sort of outing them as these inappropriate women if they do this. So if they write about themselves, it's usually in their proximity to prominent men. And if they write of their own work, it's usually with the goal to engrandize those other men. So often their successes at best have to be vicarious. Now, it's interesting because I've always written about women. I think I took this very special lens that you have to have when you're writing about women for granted, right? And it wasn't until I actually wrote a book about a man that I was able to see how differently men and women in this period sort of self-present in their papers. Now, my last and final visual aid is um, this is a book I wrote a couple years ago. It's about a man named Walter Camp, who could not be further from this conversation. He's basically the father of American football. So he invented American football, which sounds like such a diversion from anything I've ever written about before. But actually, you know, I studied gender. So I was telling his story to talk about the crisis in American masculinity at the turn of the 20th century. So he essentially invented football, which was this variation of British rugby, as a way for you know, this first generation of elite college men who had never fought in a war to become more virile. So he was essentially simulating warfare that he believed would turn boys into men. His daughter was a fairly prominent art historian and scholar, by the way, but that's neither here nor there. But in any event, I wrote that book uh, several years ago. And up until that point, I hadn't spent a lot of time in men's papers, right? So this was a first for me. And I was very struck by this man's very different self-presentation in his papers that he left behind compared to the women's that I had been researching in. And the best way that I could describe this is that there was this layer of affect, if you will, in these papers. It was almost like he knew that he was this very important guy and his game of football was going to be very culturally relevant. So his papers would be read by people someday. And because he was important and he knew his work was important, there was this sort of public self-presentation of himself in ways that I had not seen in the papers of women. You know, women in this period tend not to presume that what they're writing is gonna be of any public interest or read by future researchers at all, which in some ways makes their voice more authentic, really. You know, women in their papers are often very pragmatic, they're, they're less self-serving. They're less marketing of their own legacies compared to men who consider themselves public figures and hence very important people. So as a researcher reading the papers of women who are doing art collection or any sort of public or professional endeavor in this period, you have to get really, really good at reading between the lines and through those other lenses. If women are doing professional work in this period, like I said, they're often calling it something else. 
their stories rarely live in the official documents. They often have to be mined or teased out of the seemingly trivial scraps that they're leaving behind, often on accident. So the insights often have to be gleaned, like Veronique said, through the words of other people. You know, if they're if they're dealing or collecting art, maybe they're referring to it not in obvious ways. Maybe they're sort of referring to it as service, as leisure, as support of someone else, as domesticity, as play, as trivia, as the work of other people. And you can really, you can't expect them to think of themselves as dealers or collectors in any official or professional or legitimate or prestigious sense sometimes when no one's imagining women in that way in the collective imagination. So it requires that kind of reframing. So I, you know, I don't know, Veronique, if we want to just open it up, but I, I, that's sort of what I offer to this conversation as somebody who doesn't necessarily write about art collectors, but certainly writes a lot about women in this period. No, I think, Julie, what's really interesting in what you're saying is that as art historians, sometimes we're in our own little hole and we tend to forget that there are other people. And I think part of what's interesting in this endeavor to, re to recover women's is this idea of thinking across the field and thinking mm. across the discipline and understanding that it's not just the art collector, it's not just the, um, you know, it's not just the art dealer, but it's also the journalist and maybe eventually the women in medicine, as you've proven in your book. And one thing that I found really interesting for me, and this is something that goes, I think it's, in, it's again our instinct, especially as women, you know, uh, of, of our generation, we are, um, you know, aware and involved maybe with feminism is this ultimately, and my experience with working with women and their agency in, in the art world goes back to the 1830s when they were um, 26 women who used to write regularly every year salon criticism during the entire mm. July monarchy. Things then go down during the Second Empire, but in France during the July monarchy, a lot of the art critics are women and they do exactly what you're saying. They take another name and they say very, very clearly that they do this because they do not want to embarrass their husband or their family. They do this, and this is also something that I'm very interested in, and I don't know how much it plays into your research, but very often these women take their middle-class background, what they have learned, what they have studied, all their great education to basically, because they've fallen into our time, find a way to make money. And if you're right, you, you can protect yourself against um, against losing your respectability because you're not going up on the stage showing your legs and being a ballerina. You can hide behind the suffering. Um, so you can actually make a respectable living. To a certain extent, it was also the strategy of certain women artists. And it's interesting that when you go to women collectors, we eventually become art dealer. We also find that trend um, being kind of under the radar, but then suddenly your husband dies and then you need to find money. You need to make a living and actually, you know, selling your collection and becoming an art dealer is a very interesting thing. But very often you do it privately. You don't have to open a gallery and you keep using that network. So I think this has been a really interesting point. This idea that these women use this informal network. They're very often well educated. So they're able to either, you know, transcend the boundary of their gender because they know how to write well, they know how to paint well. Um, they've been sometimes helped by their father who decides that they, they should have better education or education similar to their brothers. But um, they are more of them that we think we're just lost them in a way. And it's interesting that this is a pattern that you can see in France in the July monarchy in the 1830s. Um, we can see this later in the, in the progressive area in the U.S., but we don't see any of these women really um, rebelling. They know better. They know that they have to find other strategy. They know that they can't just go up and say, um, oh, men are terrible. We're going to take over. We're going to take power and things. So it's a very also, I think, a second reason why they've been forgotten is because none of these women basically challenge patriarchy. 
They managed to get power without having to do this because they probably knew that if they were too challenging, they'll end up like Florent, Flora Tristan or they'll end up being called the Petroleuse or, or, or terrible names. So in a way, they were very smart, but I think that's the second layer of them being obscured because I think we see also that with women collectors, one of the reasons that they've disappeared is that until the 1980s, modernism was calling the shot when we call about when we think about canonization and a lot of these women were crazy collectors and but they didn't collect um avant-garde art they collected art that was you know nice and and wonderful and they collected the art that was part of the taste that people expected them to have mm-hmm. and in a way they were doubly erased because they didn't collect um, you know, the very, very avant-garde painters. And at the same time, they didn't challenge their places in society. So interesting you say that. And, you know, that whole idea of, of canon is like professionalization. It is very much, uh, it's a masculine notion. And, and you're right that women don't, don't necessarily question it. And it's, it's, I, I'll tell you what's been a fine line. And when I've been trying to understand what women have been doing in professional endeavors is, you know, you were talking about how they present themselves in these appropriate ways. So as not to challenge the sort of patriarchal status quo, the hard thing to know is how much of that is conscious strategy. You know, mm-hmm. I don't know that it's, it's women very consciously saying, okay, well, you know, these are, these are masculine constructs. And so this is how I'm going to work around this masculine construct. Like they're very much, they're very much, you know, part of that culture. Right. And so in many ways they've internalized Mm -hmm. their own invisibility in that space. And that's what gets really, really hard is how do you write and retrieve the stories of women who have made themselves invisible in that space? Right. And so the key (laughs) And, and this is, it's, it's very hard as a historian, because in some ways you want to get those women and their sensibilities and where they're at, but if they're internalizing their own invisibility, how much do you try to capture their own sensibilities about what they're doing and what they're accomplishing? And how much do you impose your own sense of what they're accomplishing in that period? And that's, that is very much the struggle for historians and for me personally. And there's been several times where I'll be writing about a woman in this period. I'll give you an example. There was a woman named Lillian Gilbreth. Um, She was an industrial psychologist in this period. And she was so grateful to her husband for him letting her do all of this professional work. And she would praise him. And I remember sort of trying to write about how she felt about her husband. And I remember a colleague saying to me, like, how could you write about him like he's this great guy when he wasn't a great guy at all? And I said, well, it's hard because I'm trying to capture her sensibility at this period. For her, she was doing, she was literally writing his books for him, you know, mm-hmm. and, and letting him put his name on, on the books. And my, my colleague said, how could you celebrate this? And I said, well, you have to understand her sensibility at the time was she was so grateful that he was letting her do this work on her terms. And her terms at that time were to write under his, his name, <laughs> you know? And so for her, to be really honest, because she was very much part of this culture, she didn't feel like she was being erased. She was just so happy to be able to do the professional work she wanted to do. So what if it was under her husband's name? And it was very hard for colleagues of mine who have a modern sensibility about it to think that that was okay, you know, but, but we do have to sort of capture these women where they're at. And so for people, many of these art collectors and people like Missy, you know, they're very much wanted to engrandize many of the men around them, which often meant they were just happy to be able to do the work of art collecting or art dealing, calling it something else and not getting sort of public acclaim for that work. And the way that we write about that now is I think to maybe make it clear that that sensibility Mm -hmm. was different, but then, you know, also trying to sort of tease out (laughs) despite the ways that women write about this work, 
trying to really tease out what their contributions were anyway, <laughs> which is really hard. Oh, Veronique, are you frozen? Sorry, Veronique, I think I'm gonna, maybe I'll turn off my, um, I'm gonna mute myself because I think you were you were frozen there, so. Yeah, I was frozen. My, I, I really apologize to all the participants. My, inst, my connection is very unstable. I have no idea why. Um, so the idea of eraser is sometimes, and I think this is why being an, you know, thinking about historiography is so important because at the same time, we, we feel with our modern sensibility that these women are basically contributing to their eraser by not, you know, claiming their own name and claim, claiming their own space. I think that's something that is really interesting and important. And as art historian, we need to actually take cues from our colleagues, the historian, to be able to actually understand that and really, really um, kind of articulate this. I think also uh, one thing that's quite interesting for us is, is, is for the art historian is also to be connected to the general status of women at that point. You know, uh, mm -hmm. obviously in the U.S. things were easier. Women went to school, education, uh, university. You know, Veronique, I think, are you, I don't know if you're just frozen for me or. Oh. Oh, Veronique, are you, oops. <laughs> I think Veronique is frozen. So, I don't so. know. And she was making such a wonderful point. So I'm not quite sure. I don't know, S Sandrine, I don't know if maybe it might be, if anyone had any um, questions that they wanted to ask I, while we're trying to get Veronique's um, reception. Yes, um, I, I, we had quite a few people asking questions and making Great. comments uh, from your conversation. And here I, I see Veronique to be by. No, I hate by. to interrupt her. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, go ahead. Go ahead. No, oh, you're, you're, if there's a question, I just, I just, I, she was making such a, a, a great point and I hate that we weren't able to hear it. <laughs> no, I'm so sorry. No. <laughs> shall we, shall we go back to the question now? I'm really, I'm really sorry about that. Not at all. I, I just, if you wanted to finish your point, Veronique, because I was, I was listening and, and I'm sure everyone else was as well. So. No, I was just, I was just trying to, um, to figure, to, to, to kind of think about us as art historian with our practice to make sure that we do understand um, these different sense of sensibility and we do understand how uh, um, these women actually internalized this the, the patriarchal kind of system in order to kind of get their ways. Um, and I think that's that's quite important for us to kind of keep in mind when you when you discover, when you re re recapture these women, because I think one of the things that has happened, and I see some question coming in and something we can think about it as women artists, is that then we have the tendency to only think about the exception and, and, and the women that had, uh, um, you know, someone was, I, I could see in the chat, someone was, was thinking about the, the complex relationship between someone like Rodin, for instance, and Camille Claudel. And we have a tendency to, to, to be so thinking about the biography that in a way sometimes it obscure the fact that in Rodin's studio, there were many other women artists and actually many American women artists. Mm -hmm. and, and Camille Claudel is not an exception. She's made an exception because of her relationship with Rodin and because of her mental illness, in a way. Mm. And, and that doesn't help uh, women entrepreneur in any ways, or women artists, or women collectors. If, if you're like, you know, constrained to the fact that you're a different person and, and that difference makes you exceptional. Mm. You know, I was, I see that there's all of these, um, I just see that there's all these comments in the chat, but I can't actually read the chat. I would love to be able to comment. I'm sorry. I want to be able to comment, but I don't, for some reason, I can't get into the chat. So um, will, will, will Sandrine be able to, um, as, as time by, and I kind of uh, missed, uh, 
uh, I missed a few. I was frozen for a while. Would Sandrine be able to manage the, the question for us and maybe start now? Sure, absolutely. Um, so I think there was a, a question actually about amateurism, which I thought was uh, very interesting from Mary Slim. Um, uh, so she, she says, it strikes me that the idea of amateurism was very much in vogue at this time and many aspects of the culture for both men and women. I think of the Olympic movement, which championed amateurism in athletics as professionalism or labor or even striving in any area of life was considered déclassé. So collecting as a past time rather than a professional pursuit just like amateur athletics would be deemed the only appropriate avenue for these kinds of pursuits for women but also to an extent for men so, I, so the idea of amateurism and what i what is so insightful about that comment is you know um that is completely correct there is not only a gendered element to, to this idea of professionalism versus amateurism, you know, professionalism being masculine, amateurism being coded as feminine, but there is absolutely a class element to this too. Whereas, you know, people who can afford to do these things and not be paid for it, that's appropriate for women of that class. So that that's absolutely um, insightful. And I, I think one of the reasons why it's important to understand how professionalization or how professionalism and amateurism are getting defined in this period is because it helps to understand the ways that women are getting obscured when they are doing work that now maybe in the 21st century sensibility seems professional. <laughs> it's getting called something else in this period. And so it's, it, this is almost, that's just one of the filters that we have to use. And I'll, you know, Certainly, and it's it's not just art collecting, it, it was also history writing, many fields of science, because I've written about many fields of science, really in this period, so late 1800s going into the early 1900s, we're starting to professionalize. And what generally happens as a rule, when any kind of field is professionalizing, the way that, you know, when something professionalizes, that means you're giving that field of endeavor sort of more, more validity and more legitimacy. And the way in our culture, you infuse something with more legitimacy is to give it all sorts of masculine connotation. So this is where, and, and then you also define it by what it's not. So, you know, you have people in a field that want to deem it a professional field. They start to credentialize it. You know, only a certain kind of people can do this that have a certain kind of credential more times than not, that's a credential that's not accessible to women. Oftentimes they have to go to school or they have to be in certain professional circles to get that credential, right? But then the other thing they do is they sort of code the opposite, what's amateur in feminine terms. So, you know, the amateur endeavor is stuff that doesn't happen in professional space, which means it often happens at home. It's often, you know, unpaid. It's often um, not credentialed. And so all of those things come to be associated with women. And so I, and, and the other thing, to, but I really like that that comment also talks about the class element involved in the definition of amateurism. In some strange way, it seems like amateurism is sort of the second class thing to do. And yet, there's this very sort of elite way that we define amateurism as the thing that people who can afford to dabble do. <laughs> and you're right that, so for a woman who comes from, you know, social standing, it did, it, it did look déclassé to get paid to be doing these kinds of endeavors. So she recognizes that. And certainly if she were getting paid, won't write about it in those terms. So that's another way that we have to decode what she's writing in this period. Yeah. You know, what do we do I, with the work that she's getting paid for, but can't acknowledge as paid work? No, I think that's a, that's a, that was an excellent comment. I just, um, I just thought to connect it to something you said before, Julie, which was this connection with philanthropy, 
which is also basically amateurism. And when you mm. think about somebody like Catherine Dreyer, that most of our participants would know as the woman who created an association to uh, promote abstract art in the in the U.S., there was uh, selling and interaction and and so and 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 things were happening on a commercial level. But this was never really um, talked about. People were you, you were a member of this association. You could sell your paintings. She she was the head of it and working it, organizing exhibition. The famous one at the Brooklyn Museum. Everybody must remember. Um, but at the same times, there is never any record to say that you know she she spent that money or she spent she did that or she did this. So it, it's really something that continues quite quite late in a way in in, in the twentieth mm -hmm. century. And so what happens when you're trying to trace somebody in a professional field when most of the time you you trace activity in that professional field through financial records, right? So that's also how women, women get erased. And yet at the same time, I'm going to sort of flip it because, and this was something we had talked about before, Veronique, that in some ways I was saying that, you know, women aren't consciously doing this as strategy. But there's something that they intuit just by virtue of being in that culture that makes them understand that couching this work in terms of philanthropy or, you know, or as service is what's allowing them to do it in ways that no one's balking at. <laughs> because that seems so appropriately feminine. That's, that's a feminine thing to do is to, you know, be in the service of other people, to, you know, to care give, to take care of, you know, social issues to take care of of people who need you know help in society that's deemed appropriately feminine kind of work and and when women started to work in the public sphere that was their first entree into work in the public sphere was to do it in the name of domesticity and the names of being caretakers and you know people who deal with the social so it, it there's there's like two ways that i think we have to look at it as it's not necessarily conscious strategy to sort of present themselves this way, but at the same time, there's something they intuit about it that tells them, this is how I can do this work and still be deemed appropriate. I wanted to ask you, Julie, a question um, because you mentioned the work of uh, Lucy M. Salmon in your book. Oh. Who, and I thought it was very interesting also to uh, talk about how women use certain documents, uh, uh, you know, uh, against the grain, I would say. Uh, and uh, the role also of WPA women um, and this, this something about the role the, writing the history from top down models, uh, which I think is also something very interesting that some artists or I mean, some women are doing in this in this realm. Yeah, you know, it, it's interesting because um, there's been a couple great studies. For the most part, people who, you know, study cultural history, um, they presume this top down model that, you know, it's, it's these professionals or these people, these experts who sort of dictate or somehow, you know, what they, they're arbiters of taste and that funnels down. But there's been a lot of gender historians who've actually said, actually, a lot of tastes <laughs> start from the bottom up. And actually, in many ways, that's a, a feminist lens through which to interpret what's going on, because so many women <laughs> are doing it at the grassroots level, right? And so one of the things that I wanted to do in my book was to say, yes, there are these relatively famous male historians that are the arbiters of how to interpret the past. And they're the ones that have these prestigious jobs in universities. And they're the ones that have the credentials that are these, you know, and hence are professional historians. But then there's these women who do not have credentials, who are working in historical societies, who are working for the WPA, who are working at the grassroots level Many of them are librarians. <laughs> and what's interesting about them is in some ways, they are creating historical narratives at the grassroots level that are actually getting more inculcated into the popular mind than what these male professionals are doing from on high. And so, and I'm sure that has to be the case in the art world as well, you know? Um, and I just think that if you're really trying to understand, you know, there's there's the art canon, there's the historical canon, but then there's what the, the general populace is taking in. Mm 
And certainly in the case of history, the historical messages that were coming to people were coming to them through what was being taught to them at school. The books that they were being taken off the shelf for them by the librarian. The women at the local historical societies who were shaping stories and telling kids and what they were, you know, what they were imparting as lessons. This is what's historically significant. And I have to think that there's parallels in the art world as well. And so I just think that, you know, um, to look at what's going on in the grassroots. And it, the problem is, is it's hard to know people's receptivity of art, people's receptivity of history. You know, what are the messages they're taking in? But I think that that's a very important question to ask if we're really going to understand what, what women's roles are in, in this period, because they're not they're not the ones controlling the canon, right? So that question of receptivity of just the, the, you know, in the popular mind, I think is one that we really have to try to get to to understand what women's roles are in these endeavors. And I think this touch upon also uh, a few questions or comments that I saw in the Q&A box and chat box re regarding numbers and data approaches mm -hmm. to measuring history or writing history. Mm -hmm. And um, someone was asking, what is the role and per percentage of women collectors and women air art patrons in the US today? Uh, so I don't know, Veronique, if you have figures for us right now, but maybe you can talk a little bit more about your WADA project and how you have uh, you can account maybe for the role of women art dealers and their numbers and how, how this project is gonna highlight uh, their contributions. Yeah, so that, that's actually a sec, uh, uh, an excellent question. And this is why also, in a way, we've gone a long way and we have a really solid framework, but we're still missing a lot of the data. And that's why a, pro, a, a project like WADA can only be cooperative because, you know, every time I talk to somebody, they tell me about this fabulous women art dealer in South Africa or this woman in Mexico City and, and we don't know where they are and, and they've had a great gallery, but not for very long and stuff. So again, the, the, the building of this, um, I think... You know, when I think about Samantha's, um, at the free collection, when they did this, this mapping of the collectors and the dealers, we can start mapping it and we can start uh, basically having uh, um, kind of a proportion. But what's interesting as a, I, I don't have really a lot of figure for you, you'd have to go back to the Art Basel report. Uh, but what's really, I, I mean, what I actually should say is that when you look at the contemporary time now, and when you look at gender statistics that are published in places like the Art Basel report. What you have is a great attention of the difference between women artists and male artists. And then you have a difference of ranking in terms of their value and the records at the auction. But still, we don't really have uh, a breakdown by gender in, in the galleries. And that's quite interesting. And actually, um, I will probably have more for you for this in a couple of weeks. But I'm actually talking to Claire McAndrew, who is actually thinking about integrating another layer of, of, of sophistication in our report by breaking down not just women artists and male artists, but also women artists. Uh, art dealers and male artists or, and, and male art dealers. So this is something that it's in the make. But, you know, before uh, before we met, I, I just want to give you a, a quick thing because I, I did it again, thanks to uh, the Frick Collection um, data. In the long 19th century, there's about five women, art, five women art dealer. And it's very important to realize that at that moment, most of these women do not have a shop. They either are collector who sell privately, or there's maybe one who has a shop and she had a shop before, before work. She worked at an art dealer before and then uh, opened her own. By the time we get to the, 1990, uh, the 1900 to 1950, there's about 26 women art dealer in the U.S., for about 106. And again, what do we call an art dealer? Is it someone who does secondary market, someone who sells work that may be original in a small shop up in a tourist town, or is it someone who is involved with avant-garde culture, who is part of a bohemian subculture, something like this in a big metropolis like New York or Chicago? So that's, again, something that we'll have to refine when we think about what makes a women art dealer. Um, and then by the time we think about the 1950s, 
1950, in France, there was, by the 1950, a third of all the galleries in Paris, which is about 150, are uh, led by women. They're either director, but work for a bigger, you know, an institute, the, the, the gallery, or they own the gallery on their own right. And when we think about now, there is obviously much more parity. But what's also interesting, and I want people to remind us themselves about how Marion Goodman started, um, you know, how Betty Parson started, how Marion Goodman started. They start in an humble way. They work in a bookstore and then they do prints. Um, the first great endeavor of Marion Goodman was multiple. She, you know, she didn't deal in, in big, uh, big painting. She dealt in, in, in multiple and prints. And of course, after that, so there's still a little bit, this kind of not censorship, but the capacity to get to there, not, 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 you know, not like opening a big gallery like Karin Vala did and, and put Picasso on the contract, but by doing it, uh, differently, it's also interesting that you know that somebody like uh, Betty Parson was trained by by a woman art dealer, uh, mm -hmm. Maya Stenner, which was also in New York at that time. So this idea also of these informal network that were mm -hmm. at, at stake in the 19th century are still something, at least until uh, after World War II, that make women being able to to become art dealer. Another really interesting point is, and that's the point to the parity between women art dealers and women artists, is that our findings so far, and especially in the early part, you know, uh, between the war, beginning of the 20th century, is that most women are not very keen on helping other women artists. Mm. So there is also that. We all know about Peggy Guggenheim doing this great exhibition about women artists, but that was one in a lifetime in our, in our, uh, during our practice as an art dealer. So uh, we remember the guerrilla girls doing a kind of a check, uh, a check, uh, a, a kind of a check, like a kind of a thing, like you get grades at school. And Mary Boone, which was probably the most uh, powerful dealers in the 80s, had no women artists on our roster. So we cannot, also connect, oh, women artists will get better and will be more visible because there's more women art dealer. I think that's something that needs to also be uh, taking into account for the contemporary period. Um, I'm going to try to bridge two questions together. <laughs> One person um, reminding us, reminded us that uh, statistics and numbers is a very like male and masculinist approach to writing history, which is true. Uh, and I don't think anybody will uh, argue with you about that. And someone also uh, was asking, for example, of what could be an example of woman at the gra grassroots level? What could be the kind of intervention, intervention women would do at the grassroots level? And if I'm not uh, mistaken, what you were saying, Julie, when you say gra grassroots level was probably educators. You were saying about teachers and people like that who would not make it in you know the art canon will not be written about probably and will not be counted and accounted for in kind of a statistical or like data centric approach. Mm -hmm. So and also they're considered you know de dealing in high art as well, yes. Um, yes. which you know I mean let's face it most canon gets defined as as the high or the erudite right and so um, I think we have to change our ideas of categories to really find where the women are doing the work. And I, I love, you know, Veronique, I love how you were sort of questioning the traditional categories of, you know, what is art or when, you know, is it collecting in this context? Is it collecting in this context? And I, I have to tell you now, granted, I don't have a lot of insight into the statistics because I don't, you know, I, I don't do sort of empirical research, but I'll tell you one of the things that I noticed particularly, you know, in this period that many of the women that we've been talking about are, you know, in this progressive period is trying to tease out women's professional work versus men's professional work, particularly when they're married to them or if they're in the same family. I'll tell you what logistically gets difficult is if you're looking in the, in the written documents for that work, women don't leave papers behind about people that they're literally right next to. <laughs> so mm -hmm. the letters you read or a lot of the documents you see are distance relationships. And so if you're really trying to understand what a woman 
collector's role was, and she has a very prominent collector husband, for example, it's going to be very difficult to tease out her work from his because of their physical proximity. You don't see that in, in the written documents. You know what I'm saying? Because they're right next to each other. They probably just talk to each other, you know, for all, you know, they talk to each other in bed, who knows what, you know, but you don't. And so for an historian, those more intimate relationships and, and, you know, the, the give and take between those two become very, very difficult to sort of tease out. Um, and so, I, you know, um, it's interesting, Veronique, that you were able to establish some of these women's relationships to other women. And it is because a lot of times there is a lot of writing back and forth between women in this period. So we do sometimes get a lot more of that than we do between women who are talking to their fathers or talking to their husbands because they're right next to each other. <laughs> um, I think we have time for one more question and I'm going to take one that is quite general um, and maybe to open up and also try to close at the same time. Um, so um, Kimberly, tell us, thank you. This was so fascinating. Could we hear more about how gender, class and race intersect mm. with this idea of professionalization mm. and visibility? And this is more maybe like a question of methodology and how we can write a more inter intersectional uh, version of history and especially of art history. So maybe more insight and advices or hot takes. You know, where to begin, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, you know, I think what's what's important to understand, and I think that, you know, we've been sort of talking throughout is that, that the idea of, of the professional is loaded with all of these sort of dominant connotations. Um, it does privilege a white perspective. It does privilege a, a masculine perspective. It does privilege a, a well-to-do perspective. Um, the professional, anything, is defined by th those dominant groups as a way to legitimate their endeavors. And so if that's the way, you know, it, it's getting defined, then almost by definition, people who are not that, you know, women, people of color, you know, um, people of different socioeconomic class, their endeavors, even if they very much look substantively to be the same as those endeavors, will not get defined that way. They'll get defined as the opposite. And, you know, hence they'll be seen as amateur. And, that is such an important lens for teasing out what's through which to look at, you know, how, how to reframe the work of women dealers and collectors in this period. Um, you cannot take those categories for granted. Like we do, you know, how we see them now without understanding that they are being defined in those terms. No one's explicitly defining in those terms, but we have to get very, very smart about, who, def who created those definitions in the first place? So, yeah, I think Julie, you summarized it well. It's for uh, for me thinking about women art dealer, and, and especially not thinking about the period now, where obviously there's more parodies and 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 there is more intersectionality. Thinking about the the, the kind of the period of modern art, the beginning of the 20th century to to, to 1960 or 1980s even. It's very difficult because most of the women art dealers are from the upper class. And we're actually struggling with this with WADA because mm -hmm. one of our angle is uh, using the portraits that these women had taken to represent themselves with their uh, at, at the openings and stuff and, and understanding and how do we not privilege their biography because very often they had deeper pockets. I mean, Peggy Guggenheim comes to mind, but many others. Um, and it's very rare for so far to found uh, an art dealers that had come out of nowhere that didn't have her money already. Um, the only person that I that is very very famous in France it's Bert Vey, who came from a from a not a working class but a um, let's say a, lo a lower lower middle class background who used her dowry's money to start her her her, 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 her business and stayed in business because she needed business. But what was the drawback of this is that 
because she didn't have the deep pockets that some of the women art dealer in the generation after will have, she couldn't retain her artist. So despite the fact that she was the first person to give Picasso a show in 1901 in Paris, she couldn't retain him. And then at that point, you know, he went with a dealer that had deeper pocket that su could support him. Same thing with Betty Parson, you know, the abstract expressionist went to, um, you know, Cindy Janice and then eventually to Castelli because she couldn't, she didn't have the deep pocket to, to, to or actually chose not to uh, chose not to be as selective as they wanted it to do so indeed this issue of um of 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 wealth is is something that we have to keep in the forefront of our research in order to actually question exactly as as julie said the the tenant of of, of these categories mm -hmm. and also probably reimagining other way of collecting those exactly uh, can collect. And, and I, I mean, just to, to, to finish on this, I was struck by the wonderful presentation of um, last time of uh, Elila Walker, where despite the fact that we didn't quite know um, how she collected, when she collected, obviously her salon or the place where she had her soiree was in integrated. Paul Poiret, the French collector, came. Um, thanks to our um, great, uh, our, is it our great niece? I forgot, I'm sorry. Which keeping the archives, we're able to know that. We're able to know that there's, there was this wonderful woman who was a salonniere, like any, um, any, other, any other women um, in, in the 18th century in France or even in the 19th century with a lot of power. But again, you need someone who is able to make that visible to us via uh, exhibition, via biographies, uh, uh, via, via, via the text, or, 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 or I think a movie would be actually wonderful, but that's another discussion for another day. <laughs> so it's a, a lot of work ahead then for all of us <laughs> in the future. Thank you so much. I think we're just on time. I'm sorry we didn't have a chance to answer all the questions that were posed in the Q&A and chat box, but we'll be sure to forward them to both Veronica and me. Yeah. Um, thank you, everyone. If you want to, uh, I know a lot of people have asked for the list of books that Julie uh, showed. I'm so, so sorry. You can, I, <laughs> I, mean, like, yeah, I can see in the chat that I that you couldn't see them because they were sort of, you know, blurred. Or, yes. But you have a website right. and you can find all the lists there. Uh, Veronique, is there anything else that you have, your upcoming publication you would like to uh, no, not not yet. Um, um, we we have just have a book contract on on more women artists, um, and then stay tuned because I'm trying to uh, find actually uh, we'll have a CA session and an AAH session next year, trying to expand the canon. So anybody who has anything to contribute on women uh, art dealers that are not just living in the US and not just living in Europe, uh, find us uh, or email me, and I'll be happy to talk about this. This is we're still very much. At the building site and again everything counts to to make that little uh, that little house much bigger than it is at the moment and i want to thank everybody for the fa fascinating questions and, and discussion so i look forward to continuing the discussion um of 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 zoom and through email I'm and you'll be, able to, any question. you'll be able to find all the recordings from the series on the freaks website uh, in about a month's time so please uh, have a look again thank you so much julie thank you so much oh, for my pleasure you're welcome and thank you for yeah, having me the center of for his thank you for having us mm -hmm. have a good end of the day bye-bye evening bye bye, -bye. bye, -bye.